just not. What, what people often don't do, and maybe even if they, they do find their why, there's something called subconscious bias in the brain. People have either a positive bias or a negative subconscious bias. So what happens, let me just talk you through, if I, if I may, what happens in the brain. You talk about change with Mrs. Nurkenford, okay? What happens in the first 100 milliseconds, as soon as the word change goes, it flies into our, her deep on our subconscious. In there, that's where her bias grabs the hold of it, and it says, you know what? We've been here before, and we failed. And it was emotionally horrendous. It upset you for months, so I am going to protect you about it because this is fearful. I am afraid of what this does to us over the long term, so I'm gonna start polluting your thoughts and saying, you know what, we really don't want to do it. There's not really a problem. Or somebody else is stopping you. I have all of these problems for stopping me. That's what leads to what we call sustained talk. At 300 milliseconds, that enters her consciousness. She then becomes aware of her thoughts. At that stage, they've already been violated or, or tweaked by her subconscious bias. People who are winners have a subconscious positivity bias. As soon as something happens, their brain grabs a hold of it, their deep subconscious, subconscious, and says, you can do it, absolutely, this is what we need to do, boom. That manifests as positive talk. Yeah, I can do it, this is what I need to do. So you, this is the sort of talk that you will hear from your clients, either what we call sustained talk for somebody who's making excuses, and things like, I can't do it, I, I, I'm destined to be fat. That is the brain, the subconscious parts of the brain, protecting themselves. That further. internal conversation reinforces those neural nets that Absolutely. perpetuates that behavior pattern. Absolutely. So let, let me see if I understand you correctly. One, you have to find the emotional trigger. It's not enough to understand what somebody wants to do with a goal, but the reason why that goal is important to them. Absolutely. Find a why, you'll find a way. Yeah. Second, even if you identify what somebody wants to do, if you don't identify the fear, and fear if I'm correct, is, is something that threatens us, whether that's psychologically, emotionally, or physically, yeah. and causes us to move away from that, right? Absolutely. So if we don't identify what they fear, we're still not going to be able to get them, or it's not likely we're going to be able to get that person to take the actions they need to take on a consistent basis to get the results they desire to achieve. Is that, is that correct? Is Absolutely that true. There's a little bit more to it, though. When you say that, 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 that the fear thing, so we're driven by two things. One of two things are a mixture of both. One is, is, is what's called drive theory, and that's where we're driven, our behaviors are driven by fear, or by a threat, okay? The other one is what's called incentive theory, where we're driven by a reward of some sort. So I use a number of tools mm. with, my, with, with my clients, and I teach trainers to do this, to go through this involving emotion, projecting into the future, how do you feel about this? when you've lost a certain amount of weight. Then I take them into, you've put on weight. How do you feel about it in the future? And then I go to, you've overachieved, you've really achieved your goals, how do you feel? That's a very, very short clip. So you get them to connect with what they want in the present, and then you project a positive and a negative consequence. Absolutely. Negative consequence to move them away from that result, positive consequence to move them toward which they desire. What's stronger? The and need to avoid pain or the desire to gain pleasure? It's different in different people. That's why I use a tool that combines both in one little thing because you're going to get everybody. And, and we have a little bit of both. But normally, the stronger driver is being driven by fear because what happens is when we have fear, there's an area of the brain called the amygdala. That is, and it gets, it processes, sensory information comes into an area of the brain called the thalamus and it spits it first to the amygdala, says the amygdala, Check your memory files, because that's where all of our fearful memories are stored. Is there anything fearful in there? And hmm. then it throws it up to the top, the thinking brain called the cortex, and said, what do you think about this? So they, they both input their information into another area of the brain called the anterior cingulate gyrus. And he's like the judge. And he says, well, the frontal lobes are telling me this, I want to do this because blah, 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 and this will be good for me. And the, the amygdala is saying, uh -uh, no way, this is going to make us feel horrible. I've been here before, I know it, I've seen it. Here is past behavior, best predictor, future behavior, past behavior. It provides a much more compelling case to the singlet gyrus and it says, you know what, you win. Rational stuff, 
you so what you're saying is the take home message from that professor taylor is that emotion supersedes logic in behavior modification absolutely so if i'm a trainer and i come in and i do a comprehensive assessment and i try to motivate my client with all of the logical reasons and the scientific rationale behind what i'm doing i'm still not going to succeed with that client until i could talk to them on an emotional level is that is, is that correct that, that that is absolutely correct how some, would you do that some people will just come in and, and this depends on where they are on a continuum of, of motivation. Some people are intrinsically motivated, but they're, they're your athletes. They're the people who come in and they will not miss a session. They do absolutely right. everything. They're easy. It's the people who are not in that stage of motivation that you really need. And they're often the people who are chronic failures, yo-yo dieters. Seems like that's the majority though, doesn't it? Absolutely, of course it's the majority. So tell me it's all about program design. That is very archaic in terms of looking at personal training. So here's what I think they want to know. I don't mean to speak for you, but if I may. How do you take this information? This is all great stuff. It's fascinating. Yeah. But how do I take it inside the gym, face-to-face -face with my client, and make it come to life? What tools would you use? What's the process? 